All right, welcome to part two of our first um, first laser scanning lecture. So I'm going to move into laser scanning components. And so again, a lot of this is focused on just like the laser itself and kind of the components that we'll see between both terrestrial and with, um, with airborne. But there's going to be a shift towards the more airborne focus as we move through this. So there are five major components or characteristics that kind of come into laser scanning. The first one is the light source. The next thing is what we call the beam of propagation. The third is photo detection. Fourth is propagation medium and scene effects. And the fifth is scanning mechanisms. So here is our kind of the workflow that happens within the laser scanner. So we do have some sort of calibration, making sure that it gets to be um, we, like we know that the, the laser scanner is set up correctly. Then we do, we have a photo, oh sorry, <laughs> I'm backwards here. I'm like, we do need to do this first. We do need to calibrate it before it goes out into the, the field. But really we start at the laser source because that's where it's important. <laughs> so the laser source, this is like the, the light source, the speed of propagation, these two components. So we start with the laser. We do apply our modulation. This is obviously for the, um, not for time of flight, this is for phase measurement. Then we have the focusing optics. We gotta have lenses. We, that's why we talked about lenses last semester. And, and then, so that's the working with this beam of propagation, right? So the focusing optics. And then it goes into the projection mechanism, which is my, sorry, my scanning mechanisms. So how is it being sent down to the surface and back? It's got to pass through some sort of medium, so whether it be the atmosphere or even the air in, in your, your room. You can do LiDAR with like shallow water, so it might be some water as well as passing through. Then we have, as it's returning, we end up with some background and sun illumination. The sun will cause problems. Um, you will definitely see it with the C10. They were able to implement a type of filter within the BLK360. But you'll see some like haloing that kind of happens. You have this like ray of sunlight or ray of laser points that are shining down on your laser scanner in, in your scene. It, 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 it's really kind of funny, but um, but it is it's something that happens. <laughs> so we add noise, right? So that's what that's doing. And then we end up collecting through the optics. So again, like a, a lens with um, with mirrors that put it in projected into the receiver. The receiver is our photo detection and then we calibrate. So the sunlight comes in within the collection optics, right? So it is implemented in here and but really it's detected in this collection optics. It's and it's not a part of the projection mechanism. So this is like really confusing because it's showing light going down to the projection mechanism. The sun is um, is impacting the, the what's happening out here, but we collect it here. So this this is how it's like being focused together. It gets focused with the um, with the the lidar and the actual light, and then it gets saved as part of the laser. So this is where the sun causes problems. So let's talk a little bit about the light source. So this is how we actually create the laser. Um, don't worry about all these names. <laughs> I'm just showing you kind of what happens in, in one type of laser. There's many different kinds of lasers out there. And so this is just like a version and just a, a good diagram that I found. So we have to, like the word laser refers to light amplification. And so we need to get a light. So we have light created and then it's going to pass through some medium that is going to amplify it. So it's going to become even brighter. And then it has to go through another source where it becomes very in sync with itself. And, and that's going to like excite it, right? So it becomes really excited because it's all working together. And like it's a big collection of light waves. And then it is sent out. So 
this is kind of what a light source would look like. This is, like I said, just an example one. You do not need to know all these words, but just so that you can see that there's several components that happen within here. There's electron, it's very electrical engineering, it passes through a fancy gas and then sends out. So that's the, that here. And when it returns, it's kind of the same idea as it receives. Um, not well it's not this is not return this is just a bigger one but as it receives it's not going to pass through this anymore right so um, you don't need to think of this as a return you only need to think of it as sending out so like I said here don't don't get stressed out about the, all the different parts because I'm not going to test you on that but this is important so the light source creates something called coherent light so most light that we work with is incoherent light you can see over here, we have our sunlight, which has like long wavelengths, we have short wavelengths, we have you know, medium wavelengths, they're kind of all over the place, nothing like peaks at the same spot. They're, they're just like all over the place. So it has all the different colors that are included and etc. So this is not a laser. So sunlight does not create a laser. Then what we do is we need to create it to be monochromatic. Monochromatic means it only includes one type of wavelength, so one like color. Mono means one, chrome, chrome is color, um, and we'll just refer to it in terms of wavelengths. So it's one wavelength, or like very close to each other. It is directional, so it means that it's all heading in one direction, it's not going all over the place. Like sunlight just kind of goes everywhere, even a light bulb kind of goes everywhere. Um, it's very bright, and it's what we call spatially coherent. So if we need it to be coherent, it means that the waves, the peaks of the waves, need to be in the exact same spot. And same with the valleys here. So uh, this is here is my light source for a laser. We have it monochromatic, and the waves are moving together in the same way. We are going to see co like interference, right? So speckle um, on really rough surfaces. So you'll end up with some of these waves like amplifying or like acting as a constructive interference, which will brighten it up. And it will also be destructive, which makes it go black, right? So on really rough surfaces, you'll see a bit of, of speckle from light sources or from, from the laser light source. Um, but other than that, like it's not a big deal in LIDAR, we don't see a lot, unless you're like really analyzing it, the speckle isn't a big deal, but it does happen. So the, the beam of propagation has some math and some poor formatting. <laughs> and, um, so they don't, collimation means that it stays as like a single tube, right? Like it looks like a column. Um, we don't, laser beams don't stay that way. Like light just, it has so much energy that it wants to like push away from each other, like all the little photons, they want to push away from each other. So they create like, you know, the flashlight idea where you have this triangle. And so the, that is fine. I mean, like we really can't control that. That's just how photons work. The problem is, is that the wider it spreads, the reduction, the, the worse off our spatial resolution is. So we're looking at a laser point we have this huge like beam on the ground, it's going to have a very poor spatial resolution because we're still only identifying one point within that beam. So what we need to calculate is the beam radius. So this is like half of the, the beam radius, so WZ, you can see here, at that point. So, that, so if this was the ground here at this location, how wide is that beam? So what's included is what we call the beam waist, which is here, which is the radius of the, the beam waist. And then we have the wavelength, so it's wavelength dependent. And then we have Z, which is the distance, and Z naught, which is our starting, uh, like from here to here, it says R here, but it's where Z naught is. And then N, I'm trying to remember what N stands for. <laughs> And the, um, that, that should be B in this one. So B here is the width from here to here. And yes, so that's the, the length of the, the, the waist. So 
again, you're not going to have to calculate these, but let's look at what the relationships. So if the beam waist at the most narrow point, if that radius is really high, it makes this really wide. If the wavelength is bigger, it does tend to increase this. If the, the length of Z is bigger, then like going along here, right? Going all the way along this line. If that is larger, it's going to be bigger, right? And that makes sense. The further away from the light source, the wider it's going to be. And then, um, yeah, and then the beam waste again, so it becomes squared, squared down there, but it ends up being reduced there. So, but the, the keys are the beam waste, the wavelength, and the length. So you can imagine the higher you fly in the sky with airborne LiDAR, the wider this beam is going to be when it hits the ground. So then depth of focus is another concept that kind of comes in with this diagram. And the, the depth of focus is referring to, um, to, well, this is DF, which is like not on here, but how far it goes along this line. So again, this time now, the, the shorter the wavelength, the higher the depth of focus. So if this increases, the lower this comes. Okay. So the focus component of this is how well can the beams stay together and, and to go as far as it possibly can. So that we're, we're trying to increase the length of this, this waste area for as long as we possibly can. So the larger this number is, the lower this number is. Okay, so the bigger waves tend to like separate much faster. Then we have beam divergence. This is a measure of the angle. So there's, a, there's an actual angle that we would measure from here up here. So going like that, and there's an angle in here. So the, the angle of that wavelength divided by our weight, looking at our waist as well. Again, the higher this is, the higher this is. Okay, so, <laughs> so larger wavelengths are really frustrating to deal with because they diverge so quickly and they... Um, they causes like a long. They they cause the 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 beam waste to like separate really fast. So you don't want to use long wavelengths. But the next challenge is that we're now dealing. If we're dealing with really short wavelengths, that tends to scatter faster. So, so it's a really good, like hard balancing act because wavelength it's so wavelength dependent. So we often in lidar we actually use near infrared. Um, for um, airborne LiDAR. Could you imagine like the what people would be doing if they saw like little red lights like flashing on the ground in a line in front of them as a plane flies over? <laughs> Could you imagine the population panic if that were to happen? <laughs> so um, so we tend to use near infrared uh, for, for that. So we do end up with like this challenge, right? So we end up with this like larger larger dot on the ground than what we would otherwise. So, so it's a beam of propagation and all the challenges that come with it. Photo detection. So we have different parts, the different kinds. So we have like the PN photodiode, the photomultipliers, avalanche photo, photodiodes. I am not going to go into the, the, the electrical engineering behind these, and you do not need to know the electrical engineering behind them. Just know that photo detection has ways of detecting the um, de detecting the, the the laser beam when it returns, and then it says, "Hey, I used one of these, and I get this detection, and there we go, I've got it." So I'm going to let you believe that magic happens here. <laughs> so that's why I have this like little thing here. So magic happens, and electrical engineers deal with that. And we'll just let the, or maybe electronic engineers, I should probably be more specific. They deal with that. We'll let them deal with that. Um, I don't need you to know that in this class, but just know that there's different ways of doing it and to, to be able to detect your, your beam. So the propagation medium and scene effects, there's a lot of stuff that happens in, in, in between the laser and the ground and back to the laser. So the strength of the pulse is referred to as intensity or amplitude. Um, 
right? So that, that's the exact same as what we were talking about in remote sensing. So everything that I'm doing in this class goes back to remote sensing. We can have specular or diffuse scattering. So as a quick review, specular is when it reflects off like a mirror. And diffuse scattering is when it hits and scatters in a whole bunch of directions. Then the reflectivity is wavelength dependent. So again, thinking back to um, like Rayleigh scattering, how the blue light tends to uh, scatter faster than like red light. So it is very wavelength de dependent on how it ret returns. So if we were using blue light from the airplane, it would be so scattered by the time that it returned that we would hardly detect it because it's such a long distance to travel. We know that the return value is always lower than the incident value. We, we remember that from remote sensing. It is really hard for it to increase because <laughs> these are all active sensors, right? So lasers are active. So we can measure that sent out data, but when we return it, when, when it comes back, we always know it's going to be lower. So we have to design our systems to detect lower amounts of energy. The shape of the beam changes based on a lot of things. So the angle at which the data is being collected, the incidence angle on the ground. So depending, like I was talking about previously about roof slopes and how that can elongate the, um, the shape of the, the, the dot on the ground. And the, obviously the roughness of a feature on the ground can change the shape, um, all kinds of fun stuff. Can, can cause that shape to change. So then where do we really detect the center of the beam, right? And that's where part of their challenge is. Roughness causes scattering and speckle. We are familiar with that. And we can also detect sunlight as a reflection. So we, we talked about that as well. So all of these are, are challenges that we deal with when we're dealing with our, our atmosphere, dealing with the actual target itself and dealing with just detection. So there are actually five different kinds of laser scanning mechanisms. I'm only showing four here from our textbook. So the first one is an oscillating mirror. So it just kind of flops back and forth and it sends the data, but like the data points back and forth. So this is the pattern on the ground and this is like the mechanism. So this would like rotate, you can see how it rotates back and forth and it oscillates and it's just going to detect, go down and detect and go down. We have a rotating polygon. This is usually, this is a lot of airborne stuff. Um, rotating polygons you'll find in terrestrial laser scanners because it just constantly goes around in circles and it, which is really handy because now I can do like a full 360. On the ground, um, depending on how you do it, it, it looks like this. This would look like a uh, terrestrial laser scanner. There are some airborne that can do this, and but oscillating mirror is more common. Polymer scanners are found on helicopters for the most part. They circle around. You can see them on fixed wing aircraft as well, uh, but most common on helicopters. So you can see how it like, just rotates, this kind of spins, and this just creates a little circular pattern on the ground. And then fiber scanners are kind of like a push broom scanner. So they detect a whole bunch at the same time. These are a lot more expensive. Um, and so we're going to detect full lines in, at one time and then the next. And then the very last one I put in like small print down here, we have flash LIDAR and that just does an entire scene at once. So it does like a whole bunch of lasers and then it's done. Again, a lot more expensive than what we have for, um, for our regular <laughs> scanning ideas. So oscillating mirror and rotating polygon are the most popular that we'll be working with in this class. We're not working with any helicopter data, but that would be the polymer scanner that you'll see. The rest of these are a lot more expensive. So if you have a rich, rich company, they might help you out with that. All right, basics of airborne LIDAR. Um, so, 20 minutes. So, there are six major components of airborne LIDAR, and I'm specifically going to be looking at airborne from now on until we get to the terrestrial. So we're kind of like making that full switch over. So there's the scanner itself. So we'll see the scanner. We'll see the GPS. We'll see the IMU. We'll see some sort of control and data recording unit. There will be a laptop that is controlling everything 
from there. And then there's a flight management system that deals with the actual aircraft itself. So the scanner is the laser scanner. That's where we get our lasers from. The GPS tells us our location or position on, in space based on a GPS system and, and like WGS-84. We have the inertial measurement unit, which is here. And that is um, detecting the, the way that the airplane is moving throughout space. Because you can imagine that any kind of twist, the GPS may not notice that. But that affects the angle at which this laser comes out. So we really need to have this. The control and data recording unit, well, as you can imagine, that we need to be able to time everything. So everything needs to be timed together. Everything, there's a lot that's controlled that needs to be done. So we need a lot. And then we need a big recording unit, like lots of memory space for these big projects. Operator laptop helps you manage, fit, find out what's going on. I'm not going to talk about the flight management system. You guys do a little bit more of that with, um, with photogrammetry. But the flight management system, um, allows us to detect, you know, how high is the airplane going? What is the direction it's going? All of that. So the integration of our systems is really, really important. Um, we need to know the spatial relationship between every single one of the components that are in that, that, that airplane. Where's the flight management system? Where's the IMU? Where's the GPS? Where's the scanner? Where's the data recording unit? Because all of them have a space between them, which means that nothing happens at the exact same time. So we need to synchronize all of the time measurements so that we know that when the laser comes and hits, comes back and, and is recorded, uh, like a, a, the photo detector detects it, then it has to transfer to the control unit. So there is a time delay between it actually collecting it and the control unit. And so when that information was sent out and received, I have that time delay that's between there. So how did the airplane change between that sent and received signal and how, and how did it change in terms of like the way it is shaped and the, the location that it's in? So there's a lot, like, I mean, it's crazy, like how much synchronization that needs to be put into time. Because you can imagine, like, the speed of light is like, Three point or three, it's approximately two point nine eight times ten to the eight, I think it is. So, you know, one small like second delay is going to mess up your your errors greatly. So, there are you need to know how far apart they are to at least a centimeter. If you can get it down even better, it's better because then again you can synchronize everything better. Bore site is where the laser is being sent from like, and pulsed out from the scanner. So we need to calibrate where it is exactly located and to figure out angles and quality checks. So cal this bore site calibration is really, really important. So um, the, IV the GPS and IMU combination, we have our GPS and so we need to have base stations that are set up throughout our project and they need to be less than 30 kilometers away um, that keeps it to a short baseline. We need to know the yaw pitch and roll of the IMU. So roll is like how it shifts side to side so we can see here. Pitch is how the, the point of the airplane is pointing up or down and the yaw is just how it kind of rotates from the center side to side. So the problem with the IMU is that it can fall asleep. <laughs> it gets tired and it needs to be like poked all the time to keep it alive. Um, it's just the nature of what they are. So we need to constantly have it moving and doing stuff. So as we're flying, we tend to try to keep the, the flight lines really, really short so that it doesn't go to sleep. Because <laughs> if it does, then we suddenly start losing our accuracy very, very quickly. So there is a flight planning, um, I guess, method or like operation that's called the smooth best estimated trajectory, which is the SBED. This one is our optimal flight for maintaining that IMU. So it, you have to know the properties of your IMU to be able to determine your flight plan. It was really important. So our laser scanning properties is the next thing. So we need to know 
how it is going on the ground, right? So here's showing a Palmer scanner. This is showing our um, oscillating mirror. So we have a swath width, which is the full direction from end to end, right? So that's like the swath width of a, like for example, a satellite where it goes like at what pixel does it start and what pixel does it end going across the um, the flight path? That's what perpendicular to it. And then, so the full swath width is calculated based on the height of the airplane and the angle. And the angle is like half, and we look at half of the, the angle from the nadir to the edge of that, that swath width. So the height of it really impacts the width, right? So we can cover a lot more area if we're flying high. We just won't have as many points. The point density goes down, and we'll get into that next. The footprint of the beam. So here, you can see on this one, showing in here, is how wide is that beam on the ground? So we were already talking about that, talking about like the beam width and everything else like that. So this is related to that. And how is it related to the actual flying height? Well, again, twice the height, right? And then the beam width divided by two, which is the radius. So that looks at our beam divergence. So the, these are the, the key equations that we are concerned about in laser scanning. And then, because if we fly higher, we can cover a larger area, but our beam width is a little bit higher. Um, we need to figure out how many points do we want to collect. So the pulse repetition frequency is how fast the scanner is sending out the laser signals and how fast is it receiving. Uh, so we can, you know, send out more, more faster. Of course, this is something that it, most laser scanners have an adjustment feature for this. You also have to worry about memory space for storing the data. You have to worry about the synchronizing, right? If it's too fast and it can't synchronize between all the systems, then um, you're going to have difficulty getting, getting a good accuracy, accuracy for your model. Point density is how close the, the points are together. So if you increase the PRF, generally you increase the point density. So here, the area that we cover is um, the velocity times the time times the swath width. But the mean density is the pulse repetition frequency times time divided by that area. So this will tell us how, how many points should be within that, that area. So this mean density depends on the scan pattern and the surface topography. So there's a lot of factors that, can, that whoops, go into play there. It also depends on the flying height. So <laughs> there's, there's all kinds of things that get thrown into this pulse repetition frequency. Again, you don't need to memorize these formulas. It's just good to know. So here, so here's some examples of the pulse repetition frequency and point density, so which is kind of what it looks like. So if my point density is about like one point per meter squared, we'll see that this is like what it looks like. So why would we use it? Um, basic surface model or forest inventories, those kinds of applications. If we have one to two points per meter squared, then you can see the points in there. So flood modeling, dam and water applications, so a lot of hydro deals with one to two points. If we have two to five points per meter squared, we kind of use those as multi-purpose data sets. Um, if we're creating models of like, whether it be a city or whatever, um, five to 10 points per meter squared, you can see that, versus like detailed 3D models. So this would be like more like terrestrial laser scanning, but you can see how much variation that you can have between 10 point, more than 10 points per meter squared versus like the half a point per meter squared. So if we're aiming for this, we need to know what our pulse repetition frequency is in order to calculate what, how to get this to look like that. So then another feature of airborne is these multiple echoes and something called full waveform digitization. So full waveform digitization is when we're looking at these graphs. We spend a lot of time focused on these graphs. 
and it's identifying all the different features throughout. You can do a lot of really good like classification, so you can even identify between types of trees, um, all kinds of fun stuff like that. Um, so here, like for example, it says return signal, so we get the first level of canopy, we get the canopy structures, then we get like bushes that are in there a little bit, and then we get the ground. So if we sat there and like analyzed what is going on in this, that is a full waveform digitization. So and that's what that's what we're really focusing on. So and it says the the return it records the return echo, so all that whole shape. So we can really identify like where these peaks are, where is the the time rise starting, so um, the leading edge. You know, we can do the constant fraction uh, detection. Like there's, there's all kinds of things that we can do with this information. So the more information you have, the more expensive it is, but the more we can actually get out of it. So, so time of flight receives discrete echoes. So you can see here that we have like first return, well, the second return, well, the last return. It kind of identifies those returns right away. Um, and so there is a stop signal at a certain certain rise times so you can see here that it doesn't really identify this canopy structure because it, it the stop signal said hey this is all part of this particular um, this particular bump but we can determine so much more through this full waveform so there's also no information about the shape or the intensity because it is literally just a yes you have received something and so we need to have like distances between each of these peaks, they need to be larger than the pulse width, right? So if the pulse width is like this, then this part doesn't get identified like it's showing here. Yeah. So looking back and forth, this is not what you get with a time of flight. You get this from a time of flight. You get this with a full waveform digitization scanner, and those are a lot more expensive. But for forestry, they really like them because they can determine a lot. They can actually get like the biomass and everything from that. So error budget, what can we determine from our errors? So <laughs> in the Z direction, we're looking at about five centimeters to about 20 centimeters in the Z direction. This is for airborne, right? So we're not talking terrestrial. Um, and then our X and Y is about 20 centimeters to about a meter. And this is merely just because of the how often we can send those pulses down, right? So, so what's key here is, is this. So photogrammetry has an accuracy of about 25, 15 to 25 centimeters. In the Z direction for LiDAR, we can get down as good as five centimeters. So our Z accuracy is significantly higher for LiDAR than it is with photogrammetry. With the horizontal, it's a little bit less. But with modeling and interpolation, we can actually improve that, okay? Or at least try to maintain it. We're not limited by pixels in this case. We're, we're merely limited by, um, by data memory space that we have. So sources of error that we'll see, GPS, IMU, scanner assembly, right? So the, all that put together, the calibration of that, is, can cause a lot of error. We have limited accuracy of the flight path. So like an airplane can only detect how much it moves to a certain point, um, again, based on GPS. And we and the flight path, sometimes if you've ever been in a small airplane, um, you'll often see that or hear them saying, oh, you need to move your height to a certain level because of something coming in. And so suddenly now your project has changed because your, your height had to change. And, but there's not much we can do about that to fix that. Of course, you, you, through Transport Canada, there's a bunch of different things that you can do to try to limit that issue, but sometimes it, it can't be helped. Um, complexity of the target. Errors always come from that, right? That even comes from remote, like other remote sensing stuff. Like as soon as the target's really complex, you just can't do it. Uh, Multipath. Multipath happens all the time. So again, that's another error. And good old coordinate transformations and geoid correction. Every time you do a map projection transformation, you're going to end up with error. And that just kind of feeds into this as soon as you get it out of the WGS84 from the GPS. 
So what does the processing look like? Well, we start with some ground and GPS data, and then we make it differential, right? And we include the IMU, we have to include the range data from the scanner and all of the calibration and mounting data, right? So this has all that time synchronizing. Everything comes together to create a point cloud of X, Y, and Z in the WGS84 with quality control. So at this point, our quality control includes checking completeness, checking that the measurement density is okay, um, adjusting flight lines if you are doing this at the time of. So you can sit there and say, okay, you need to increase or decrease your height so that I can get the best fit for, um, for my model. And checking ground truth data. So does the ground truth data match what we're seeing here? Then we take that data and we're required to classify it. So we're going to classify our data based on elevation, amplitude, and echo number. Those are the basic classifications. We can, we'll be talking more about other classifications later and just, you know, based on feature extraction. So, but these ones are, are the basics that you need with any LiDAR. And then from there, we can create our DTM or our DSM, whatever we need to for that case. So, the last slide of, of this lecture is talking advantages and limitations of airborne LiDAR. So these are only a few of them. There's many more, and I encourage you to think of, of more. But be careful about how you phrase anything when you're talking advantages and limitations. So here I'm, I'm giving general statements, but I'm going to explain more from it. So maybe take some note of that. But so advantages, this is great in leaf off conditions. So it, it, as soon as the leaves are down, send out your LiDAR and go out and check it out. It, we can see through deciduous trees if we have those leaf off conditions. Photogrammetry can't see through them. Even if you have leaf on conditions, you can still see through some of these deciduous trees. There is a high measurement density and data accuracy compared to photogrammetry or satellite-based um, satellite based data, right? So, but if I compare this to, for example, um, terrestrial laser scanner, this is much lower. If I compare it to a total station, this is not true at all. This doesn't hold true. So make sure that when you're talking advantages, in this case, I don't say it, they like written down there, but I'm saying it to you, that compare it to something. It's an advantage over top of um, over top of satellite imaging or photogrammetry. We also have fast data acquisition. So again, comparing that to terrestrial, we have a lot faster data acquisition over those areas, and it's a lot of data over those areas. So again, it's not as it may not be as fast as photogrammetry now, but it is still faster than satellite imagery, because even satellites, you don't get it instantaneously. It has to go to a master control station. It takes a couple days. Here, we can get it almost, almost instantaneously. We can also get canop canopy penetration if it's not too dense. So they use a lot of LIDAR down in the tropical rainforests <laughs> so um, to try to identify things for archaeology. So canopy penetration can happen if it's really dense, like conifer trees, so, so looking at like the boreal forest. If there's a lot of um, a lot of coniferous trees that are bunched together, it it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't penetrate very well at all. Uh, it does require minimal ground truth data. So really, you go out. You can almost do these projects with like a single person. Somebody runs out, sets up the the GPS base stations. They run over to the airplane. You just need the, the obviously a pilot. And then they manage everything on the airplane, and then once you're down, then you go and collect all that GPS data, and you're gone, right? So you don't need a lot of ground truth data, which saves a lot of labor time. Limitations is that it cannot penetrate cloud, fog, or dense vegetation, right? So we're deal dealing with mostly visible light, a little bit of near-infrared. So those are all, the like cloud, fog, and dense vegetation are all opaque to those. Um, I can't, you can't see through dense conifers, like I mentioned, so like boreal forests are, are tough. Multi-story rainforests are also very tough because, again, 
that most of them are leaf on <laughs> and they just like they're so dense and there's so many layers to it that trying to penetrate more than five returns is, is difficult. We also have an issue of water absorbing the signal. Um, so, but that's deep water. So if we look at some of the, there's a lot of hydrological LIDAR that's being done. And so the, the water doesn't absorb the sig signal at that point, right? So it, it, it's good for shallow water. Um, again, it depends on how high you are flying and there's a lot of other things that go into it. And we don't get into the hydrological LIDAR in this class, but the, it is a possibility for you to to do it just it, it tends to absorb the signal so clear water reduces the signal strength there's a lot of data storage required so compared to like going out and doing a small terrestrial like total station survey um, even if you were to do the same house with like a with with, with lidar you still need more data because you have so many more components that are included in that point cloud so the points really require a lot of data and then finally, um, there's large computational requirements um, if you are modeling. So, because you, you got so many points. And so to be able to put it all together, it, it requires a lot of post-processing to create those models. Models are, are pretty much always like that anyways. Um, although photogrammetry tends to have a little bit more automation that's done, but a true model requires a lot of hands-on work. And you guys will find that in photogrammetry. So that is everything for today. So there's, um, I have my references here at the end. But to, to kind of wrap up what I just talked about. So I introduced lasers and what they are and the components of lasers. I talked about the different types of measurements that, um, that LiDAR can use. We talked about measurement uncertainties and what those are. Talked about multiple returns and why that's important for airborne LiDAR. We talked about all the components of the airborne LiDAR and why they're all um, essential in order to create a project. And then we finished up talking about advantages and limitations of airborne LiDAR. So I look forward to seeing you guys next week. This is a lot of information this week, but we'll move into the next part, which I believe is looking at registration and calibration. So see you next week.